All right, so let's get started. This is uh, the Spheres reading group, and uh, we're here with uh, John Ebert, uh, Wendy, Jeffrey, Jonathan, Nate, and Johnny. Uh, and um, since uh, all of us, other than Johnny Davis, were on the call last week, we're not going to reintroduce ourselves. But before we dive into the text, uh, which uh, we'll begin uh, with uh, John uh, Ebert uh, giving his introduction, and then uh, from there we'll opening up a conversation. I want to let I want to welcome uh, Johnny you to the conversation in the space Thank and you. give you a chance. Yeah. Uh, it's really good to see you, and, and we, we've been interacting uh, quite a bit uh, lately, uh, including on the forum at infiniteconversations.com. And um, uh, what we did last time is we each took a, a, a couple of minutes to introduce ourselves, brief, brief introduction. So I want to give you a chance to do that before we dive into the text. Well, I don't really need to do that. I mean, I'm just enjoying the text. I've been, I saw your, uh, your conversation last week. And um, I feel like I'm tuning into it and opening up to it. I have something to share, um, but I'll do that later in the conversation, hopefully. Okay. Then uh, without further ado, I'll I'll turn it over to uh, John Ebert to introduce uh, this section of the text, which we're covering today, which are the preliminary remarks and and chapter one. And of course we can bleed backwards or forwards. Uh, I've been kind of on, I've been keeping up with the reading. I haven't jumped ahead myself. Uh, but I know others have or uh, have even uh, gone on to other texts. Uh, so, but our main focus will be the be the preliminary reflections in chapter one, and I'll pass it to you, John. Thank you, uh, Marco. I appreciate that. Um, so uh, we have here preliminary reflections thinking the interior, and um, I think the key word there is interior, it's going to be the key word all throughout because I think what, what's going to happen here is that Sloterdijk is laying the groundwork uh, in this uh, preliminary reflections, but also in the, the heart, the Eucharistic excess for his concept of the self as a hollow subjectivity. And I think that this is one of the innovations of, of his text is introducing the self as something that's hollow because um, the Western transcendental sense of the self, let's say from the uh, Cartesian cogito down to Husserl has been of the strong self, which is a sort of extensionless monadic point that exists in what Heidegger would call Vorhandenheit, which is to say uh, an entity in, this, in Vorhandenheit is in the space of self-sufficiency. Okay, so it's in vectorial Cartesian phase space, completely self-sufficient, and it requires no connections to anything else around it. That's basically the goal of what science does. It takes objects and deworlds them removes them from their contexts and puts them in a vectorial phase space, analyzes them uh, with whatever tool is at hand, infinitesimal calculus or whatever, uh, to give you a sense of the cross-sectional analysis of this thingness of this thing that is deworlded. And the self, too, in the Western tradition has been deworlded. It has been the very lonely, and, and you can think of Descartes writing his meditations with his fur on by the fireside, with his pen in hand, uh, very lonely uh, undertaking, Montaigne writing his essays, and, and so forth. Uh, it's been that way right down the line to Husserl until Heidegger was the first to start taking the self out of Vorhandenheit and embedding it in uh, a world, into a particular world horizon, and sort of uh, putting it into a ground of being at the coincidentally, that camouflage is being invented in World War I, and camouflage has the effect of taking a figure and embedding it in its ground, so that from up above, it's uh, no longer figure versus ground, it's become pure ground. And in a sense, I think, with Dasein, that's what Heidegger is trying to do to the self. Uh, but Sloterdijk, I think, what he does here, uh, he introduces the self as this uh, feminine, hollow receptacle. Now, in the previous chapter, we had seen that uh, God... Uh, created Adam as this sort of hollow Neolithic clay figurine uh, with nothing inside of it. And then he had to blow, he had to fill it by blowing breath into it, spirit basically into it to enliven it and animate it. And now it's no longer hollow. And I think Sloterdijk wants you to keep that image in mind as he goes into this chapter. uh, And he talks about uh, that you never give the hero his candy because candy uh, has the property 
that it enters into one's subjectivity and hollows one out and makes one submit to the sweetness. Uh, and so this parade of uh, luxuriant pleasantness goes down uh, through the tongue into the cavity and uh, the hero has to submit. So one thing you never give a cowboy is a candy bar. You'll never see a cowboy uh, in a Western eating a candy bar. It doesn't happen because for this reason, he's, we have the strong transcendental self and it can't submit to something like that. So uh, he begins to introduce the of sweetness here uh, that is the part of what he wants to say that the infant, the first thing it does, the first object that it's after is the mother's breast and it derives sweetness from that. And it begins to form its subjectivity from that first binune dyadic relationship with the mother body. Um, and then as he moves into the chapter on the heart, the Eucharistic excess of the heart, he gives three examples, four total, one, one from science, but he gives three from medieval and Renaissance works where he wants to lay the groundwork for how the mechanics of this biune microspheric dyadic relationship works. And in the first account, what he talks about is this medieval tale of this knight that's in love with the lady. And the typical uh, situation in the Middle Ages is with the woman who is forced in an arranged marriage with a king uh, that she doesn't love. And they're very often loveless marriages. So you get the courtly romances. Tristan, Isolde, and King Mark is the classic example of this, uh, where the knight comes along, falls in love with the lady, and they're really actually in love. Uh, and the husband uh, is variously jealous for different reasons. So in this case, the husband gets jealous and he sends the knight out to the Holy Sepulcher uh, to get rid of him. So he volunteers to go out to the Holy Sepulcher and he dies out there, but he gives his squire instructions to open him up, take his heart out, preserve it, take his, he's got the lady's ring. So take the ring off of his finger and it should be footnoted here, by the way, though Slaughterdeck doesn't mention this, that the ring, the reason the ring is on the third finger of the left hand is because there's an old belief that there was a nerve or an artery connecting the third finger to the heart. So the reason that ring is on there is because one's heart belongs to another. That's an interesting little subtext that's folded in here, but Slaughterdeck doesn't mention it. So he gives to the squire the heart and the ring. The squire brings them back uh, to when the king knows what's up. He realizes what's going on here. So um, as an allusion to the myth of Pelops, he goes into the kitchen, uh, chops up the heart, cooks it up, makes a nice meal, and he serves it to his wife. And he says, here, you alone should eat this. Nobody else. This is a perfect meal for you. Go ahead and eat it. She chops it down. And after she's eaten it, he says, well, I just cut up your lover's heart and you have now eaten his heart. She goes white, renounces food, and basically dies. And um, Slaughterdike makes the comment then that this is a kind of profane version of the Eucharist. In a certain sense, uh, the kitchen is the place where the transubstantiation act happens. Uh, the king, uh, as cook, is in the role of the priest and the heart becomes a profane substitute for the wafer. Uh, and instead of ingesting the body of Christ through the wafer, she is ingesting the body of her beloved through consuming his heart. The point being here, and this is a point we're going to see as he develops it in greater and greater detail as we go along, that the self is formed through intersubjectively gobbling up other selves. Selves hook together through gobbling up each other. And in the Middle Ages, this process of gobbling each other up was always represented through mystical effluxes. Uh, one shared one's effluxes, not just bodily as in the sex act, but there are psychological effluxes uh, that go from one individual to another, and they create hooks that link individuals together in biune, dyadic, microspheric relationships. So then he gives the second example, which is the example of Catherine of Siena, the mystic, uh, who claimed that Christ came to her in a vision uh, sliced open her uh, left side, uh, took her heart out, and sealed it back up. She goes to confession and says, I don't have a heart. Christ has taken my heart. And he says, well, that's impossible. You can't exist without a heart. She says, nevertheless, he has done this. Uh, then she has another vision where Christ come back. He comes, he returns to her, and he removes his heart, and he puts his heart in place of her heart. So now she has his heart. Um, once again, we have the, the trading of mystical effluxes. Only in this case, the, the uh, microspheric relationship, in the first case, the microspheric relationship happened on the amorous plane as a kind of model for a way in which lovers form 
microspheric relationships by gobbling each other up. And the heart becomes a metaphor for that process. Uh, in the second case with Catherine of Siena, it's the microspheric relationship between the individual and his or her God, uh, as we saw in the first chapter with Adam and, 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 uh, and God. There's also a hidden subtle that Sloterdijk does not mention, which is that um, there's a, I think there's an allusion here to God opening up Adam's rib cage, taking a rib out and turning it into Eve. Um, there's part of that in there because later on, uh, when Christ is pierced by the spear, when he's up on the cross, he's pierced by the spear of Longinus, which pierces his side. And that image is meant to refer back to Adam. Christ is the new Adam. And it's meant, meant to refer back to Adam's uh, vulva. Basically, that is uh, what happens uh, in the second phase of being in the world, where being in the world means no longer to be in the mother, but being in the world now means being in the father. It's the appropriation of the feminine womb as the paternal vulva. The man now has in the metaphysical age that begins with Plato and extends to Husserl because the man has the vulva because the vulva now uh, is inside the male psyche and it gives birth not to biological forms, but to ideas and mystical grace that pours through that vulva. There's even an image of Catherine. uh, He quotes uh, of Catherine drinking from the side of Christ, drinking uh, fluids, uh, which is rather interesting given the fact that uh, the wound in the side of Christ, we, I've found many examples of this, is represented as a vagina. Uh, I've seen it uh, in, in many illuminated manuscripts. Um, so there's that. There, so we have that. And then the third example he gives occurs on the philosophical plane where he has uh, a text translated by Marsilio Ficino in which uh, two men, Lysias and Phaedrus, fall in love with each other. Lysias and the younger man is Phaedrus. And what happens there is that um, mystical effluxes come up out of the heart of Phaedrus. They go out through his eyes. They go into the eyes of Lysias, and they go into his eyes and down into his heart so that the two are connected together by this sort of philosophical, mystical communion that occurs now on the philosophical plane, which almost gives it now shifts the model from the amorous sphere uh, in the first example to, in the second example, the, the theological sphere, and now to the sphere of the teacher and the pupil, the kind of uh, inner subjectivity that's going on between them. And I would draw, uh, before I finish here, I, I know people want to jump in here, I would draw an analogy to, uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Lynn Margulis's theory of uh, endosymbiosis, theory, uh, that she became very famous for this idea, which is now common in textbooks, that uh, cells have emerged by gobbling up other cells. Uh, other cells, uh, and how they did this was like if you look at a plant cell, a plant cell has chloroplasts in it, and chloroplasts were once free living cells that were responsible for photosynthesis. They got gobbled up by larger cells that could not digest them, and so they became organelles that handle the process of photosynthesis. And so this symbiotic process emerged when cells gobbled up other cells. Same thing with animal cells. In the case of mitochondria. Mitochondria are what enable us to respire oxygen. Those cells got gobbled up and became organelles, and mitochondria actually have their own separate DNA, uh, separate from the nucleus. So we know that they were once free living units. Uh, that provides an interesting analog, I think, for what Sloterdijk is doing here, redrawing uh, the Western transcendental subject as something that emerges by gobbling up other cells. cells. Um, and then finally, the final example he gives here is from Lama Tree, his book, Man and Machine, where he says, what happens later, though, all of this gets lost, um, starting with William Harvey in 1628, who publishes his work on the circulation of the blood and realizes that there are no mystical effluxes coming out of us. There's just the individual alone with his heart, and all the heart does is pump fluids throughout the body. It doesn't send any emanations out. Now, um, So this essentially has the effect of cutting the individual off from other individuals. And the individual with the Western transcendental subject in Vorhandenheit as its own uh, transcendental unity. Note that this happens very shortly after Copernicus sunders the earth from all the crystalline spheres that surrounded it and the angelic beings that sent their emanations down through it and connected everything together. So the planet Earth became decentered 
put into orbit around the sun and it's on its own now. So it's out in space, thrown in the Heideggerian sense of being thrown, just as with the heart, the heart now with William Harvey is cut off. Now we're all cut off from each other. There's such thing as any kind of mystical effluxes connecting us to each other. And so Lama Tree in the 18th century was famous for talking about the, the soul as just a fancy kind of machine. And all of this comes to a crashing halt. And so that's where Heidegger ends, or uh, Slaughterdike ends the chapter with this sense of uh, the individual heart being separate, the, the individual being being separate, the earth being separate. And so we're left with all of these separations now. And in contemporary modernity, uh, this is what we've inherited, a world of separate selves and a world of separate things, all cut off, all in the mode of four Honden height, self-sufficient entities. And we're trying to figure out how to put these things back together. And so uh, Slaughterdike in this chapter, which initially seems puzzling the first time you read through it, why is he talking about all this, uh, is because he's laying the groundwork for uh, how he's going to show that his concept of the self is hollow until it is filled with other selves. And so with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to you guys. Um, I mean, um, I do find it interesting, the connection with uh, the, whole, the whole like sacred heart mysticism with, with Catherine of Siena. I've always found it interesting in, in the Western tradition and in, in Catholicism, uh, there's a kind of bodily mysticism which uh, which you don't really find as much in like Eastern Orthodoxy and like a lot of Eastern Orthodox people find the sort of emphasis on the sacred heart, very worldly, you know, it's it, the, the, and, and that sort of gobbling up, up of each other is this interesting kind of intersubjective bodily um, rec recognition of, of like, uh, of eminence that uh, this is peculiar to that situation. I do want to, I do find it interesting. You mentioned the um, uh, like, the Copernican decentering of, of the earth. Cause I, I find that's a common narrative that, that with Copernicus, we decentered the world and came. I, I actually, I actually want to challenge that a little bit because uh, you know, that's, that's that whole world. Uh, Cause back then they had an Aristotelian view of the world where the reason that other objects gravitated towards the earth was because the earth was the densest of the four elements. And so the other planets were made of the celestial spheres. Um, where uh, whereas the sun was sort of was actually this sort of exalted thing, and and then and by putting the sun in the center and saying it has a gravitational force, that was actually uh, in a sense elevating the Earth above the sun, and it, and it kind of goes with the hubris of the Enlightenment that uh, that uh, the uh, where where man tried to become his own god and become becomes the sort uh, you know, and you have the you know man man like becoming God through his, uh, you know, scientific advances in, in, uh, and mechanistic, uh, uh, cosmology. So. Uh, maybe to just extend on what Jonathan said to give it an, another image. Cause I found that really interesting. I never, I never encountered that. Um, is it maybe what you're saying, Jonathan, that in the enlightenment humans gobbled up the sun and, became the sun is that another way to frame yes I, I think that's a that's a brilliant image uh and i um, and yeah it's it's sort of it it's me what the what the sort of copernican revolution did was it flattened the celestial spheres and made it like us so that so that we so that we became became elevated and and were and were able to stand on equal ground with like this we yeah, was in yeah, in this sort of traditional neoplatonic world, you know, the like the celestial sphere is sort of above the earthly plane, you know, and and uh, and then you know the like traditionally pre-Christian the planets were gods, you know, that's that's sort of where this whole discipline of astrology came from, was was the, the was the planets were gods that influenced the earthly earthly affairs, and then with with this Copernican revolution, we actually have the elevation of Earth to the level of the celestial spheres. So yeah. If I might jump in here, there's um, I, I have done a lot of work with a collaborator on who um, it's not my work, it's her work, but she was looking at heart transplants, and one of the things that they uh, discovered was that um, you know people we have this idea of organ don donor organ. Uh, 
donation that you can just give across your liver or your heart and nothing of the personality goes with it. It's just an organ. It's like a, a car and, and you put a different motor in a car and it still runs. But in fact, the way people actually deal with these, when, when a receptor or a, a person receives uh, a heart uh, uh, organ as in, a, in, a do, in a donation, um, people experience that as being the personality of the person comes with the heart. And there are all these connections that go on between people uh, in that the go beyond what the sort of medical discourse tells us about these things. Uh, and uh, some people experience things that, that, that their, their donors had experienced or they, they contact the families or, or there's all these relations going on. So it seems that even in the modern world, there are elements or intrusions of these older ideas of effluvia that are still present in our, in our visceral understanding of the world as opposed to our intellectual understanding, which is more on this sort of disembodied kind of approach to things. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can I add something to that? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, been, um, I've been studying uh, recently about polyvagal theory. I don't know if anyone's familiar with this, but it's very interesting because um, this man, Stephen Porges, he says that uh, the vagus nerve is like a wandering nerve in our body, and it goes from the, the cranial in the back of the head through, all, uh, through the spine into all of the viscera. And he's talking about uh, the parasympathetic system, um, the autonomic nervous system, how uh, the fight, flight, freeze dynamic is hardwired in us. But that he's talking about a new parasympathetic nervous system, which is uh, being activated. Um, and he's talking about the, the vagus and the heart is connected to the eyes and the face. So there's a direct connection between the face, which is a, is a communication system, and this uh, vagus nerve in the heart, and all the other viscera. So uh, there's a two-way communication from brain to the organs, from the organs to the brain. And I thought that was very suggestive because in John and his description, also what you were talking about, uh, Jeffrey, with the um, heart transplants, um, that there's, uh, I think the modern mind, which has sort of infected the pre-modern, is now having to put it back together again. And I think we're getting a lot of evidence for this. Uh, I think um, I think you mentioned uh, Phaedrus and Lysis, uh, that story about those two uh, male lovers and how the eyes and the heart, uh, they entered into this uh, communion with one another. So, I'm just offering that as a, something that I think is very suggestive. Um, but also on a personal note, I, I had a dream last night um, since we, I think, uh, I think this is uh, relevant because the material, I, I've been reading it and I've been absorbing it. And I sort of, right before bed, I sort of read a few passages. And I had this... Uh, a non-ordinary kind of experience. I'd slept for about four hours, and when I got up in the middle of the night, I, I did a sort of meditation practice, and I felt a strong vibration, um, which I think is related to the Vegas, actually. Um, and I had this soaring experience. I was going up, 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 up um, with this other being, and it was uh, very light-filled and very ecstatic. And then we settled into this uh, sort of... Uh, I, sort of Greco-Roman architecture, and there were other entities, I would call them there, and uh, this other being that I sort of shared this uh, this womb-like space uh, became differentiated, and he was he became like a very beautiful um, man from, uh, I think, a, and I asked him, I said, um, are we um, past life lovers? Uh, were we lovers back in Rome? And he said, yes. And I asked him his name, and he said something like Cyclees, and I asked him to spell it, 
And I realized as I asked him, my linguistic mind is sort of interfering with this experience of the great lover, right? I, I was very aware of that. Well, we're speaking in English, but he understands my English. But if he's going to write this down, he will write it down in either Latin or Greek, which I don't understand. And I found in this dream space, um, or whatever kind of space this was, I found a pencil and paper and I asked him to write it down, his name. And that's when I started to lose connection with him. And uh, when I reflected on this in the morning and I felt very blissful after this experience, and I had several interesting experiences after that, um, I started to, I looked up Cycles and I don't know if I had the right spelling or not. I don't know if it's Latin or Greek or whatever, but all I got was Cyclesa, which is an oral contraceptive. Uh, so that wasn't very helpful. But I'm thinking about how I put this text together with certain tensions and stresses in my own life. And also, uh, I don't necessarily believe in reincarnation. I mean, it's not necessarily a, a belief I hold dear. I'm, I hold that very lightly. But in this uh, experience with this uh, entity, I did find myself, I think... Um, reanimating what I had read about with uh, Lysis and Phaedrus and the modern entering in and, and sort of infecting the pre-modern. And now I think we have to reclaim the healthy aspect of the, the magical and the mythical um, with our, uh, the healthy rational um, to bring about this, um, this healing process um, so that we can be released from, I think, uh, the old, uh, what I think Porges would call that old uh, parasympathetic uh, stress-filled uh, system, which fights, flights, f flights and flees, or, or at any rate is always in a state of uh, uh, disruption or disconnection. And uh, this, for this, uh, hopefully this new parasympathetic system will start kicking in soon with this, um, this what he calls this uh, social engagement system of the, the face and the heart. So at any rate, that's what's happening with me as I read this text. And um, I think as we enter into these liminal zones, and I think Schlatterzeit discussed this quite a lot, we start to, um, you know, open ourselves up to these new possibilities. So thank you everyone for giving me that opportunity to share that with you. I hope it's relevant to our discussion here. I was just thinking just now about um, blood donations and how uh, like they're just like for I don't I don't know if it's changed recently but until until recently like, uh, homosexuals weren't allowed to uh, to donate blood and then for a long time black people couldn't donate blood and and so it's interesting like the the sort of social stigmas we have about whose blood we allow into our bodies uh, and and uh, and it's interesting how it connects to this this. Uh, idea of the intimacy of the heart and, and the blood and and um <coughs> and now and we still have this this whole mystique about the body and the blood of one another um we also have um i'm reading another author he's a medical doctor he has a condition called mirror touch synesthesia. And I think I have a little bit of this myself, and I think all of us to some extent do. But evidently, there's this great overlap in the visual and in the kinesthetic. So that this, and he's a medical doctor. So when he gives a person a shot, like a, a spinal tap, he feels the sensations of the needle going into his own spine. Now, this could be, I would think, a terrible a choice of a profession for someone who has this condition, but he says it gives him great insight. Diagnostic skills are amplified because he can sense what's going on in the other person's body in a very direct way because it happens in his body. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of us have, I think it's a matter of degree, um, but I think in our modern era, I think of Coleridge when he looks at the sunset and he says, I see, but do not feel how beautiful you are. I think he's expressing that modern notion of disconnect between the visual and the kinesthetic system, which I think is, you know, the structure of phobia, actually. Um, and I think we're trying to try to heal this in our modern era. But I think there are some people, like this doctor, to a modified degree, I think myself, there's about a 2 or 3% um, of the population which where these synesthesias are uh, you know, hardwired in them. So we're sort of vestiges, I think, of a previous age, which is sort of 
not given enough um, attention to because so many of our experiences are pathologized. And I thought this doctor was very, uh, he said he didn't feel like he had something that was pathological. He just had, he, he said he had a different kind of trait. Uh, I think the, but that's the word he used. Um, then, uh, and he thought that that was a better way of thinking of it than uh, as a pathology. So anyway, I was just riffing off what you were just saying. Right. Yeah. And I think this kind of, I feel like it's kind of set up um, an interesting kind of uh, like view of uh, this kind of leads into a different kind of view of perception, which like, yeah, you know, we're, we're in this sort of human sense data uh, view, view of perception, you know, like in the enlightenment, whereas I think this is a moving towards sort of a whiteheadian concept of prehension, but where, where perception is encounter, like the, in, the intersubjective kind of, um, is sort of primary as opposed to sort of the objective uh, encounter that, that we have as uh, as a perceiver and a per, uh, of an object in like in, in the environment. Um, and I'm kind of reminded of uh, in uh, in the letters of Saint Paul. I, I don't have a Bible in front of me, so I don't I, I can't quote the line. But what, like uh, in one of the few in one of the parts where he actually talks about uh, sexual morality and tells people like not to sleep with prostitutes or whatever, he like he's not he doesn't say like you know sex is is wicked and and corrupt and vile. He's saying that you're you're essentially mixing your essence with the other person and uh, and and so and essentially essentially like you don't want like you have to be careful about that you know and you're you're taking this other person into you it's essentially ingesting them with in, in sexual act. Um, which in, in, in Buddhism, if you have sex with someone that's like, you have seven lifetimes of karma with them. So that's, um, so, so it's interesting, like this, uh, the, this, this idea that the physical contact or, or like, or any kind of like interaction kind of creates, um, this uh this mixing of energies and i, I think of you know rupert sheldrake and the idea of like you're creating a morphic field with this other person so uh, i um i think it's really interesting that that we could look at the relationship between inside and outside and between what we consider as ourselves and what we incorporate that we regard as other we can look at that at different levels of existence. Or for example, the, the bodily, the, the physical, the physiological, the, organ, the, the organismic, and then take that to the psychological uh, and perhaps to the spiritual. Uh, and where those um, parallels uh, hold validly and, and where they might lead us astray. Uh, because when I think of uh, my biological being, I don't want to take anything and everything into my being into my physical body. I don't want to, uh, you know, eat um, a squirrel that, that might have um, the plague, you know, from, from my backyard. Uh, it's important that I differentiate, that my body differentiates between what is healthful and nourishing and what's harmful and, and or potentially poisonous uh, or, or infectious. Uh, and does that carry over into the, psych, into the psyche as well? Are there just uh, entities... Uh, um, memes, meetings, uh, ideas, uh, spirits, I mean, different ways that we could think about that, that are actually poisonous for us, that actually we don't want to metabolize, or that if we cannot metabolize, we need to reject. Uh, there was one particular passage that struck me, um, page 95, where um, Slaughterdick has just begun speaking about the, uh, uh, about uh, this what he called the philosophy of sweetness and this primary object of of the the mother's breast and, and the mother's milk being being a primordial experience and being overwhelmed by uh and kind of taken in the taking of the of the sweet the nourishing object and of course the mother's milk is the most healthy the most uh nourished possible food uh for for a child uh but the child moves on to that to other forms of sweetness or other forms of of nourishment, and um, and then he he goes on on page ninety five to say, and I'll quote this: that it would seem that in such questions, the role of self will and rapture are inverted, and that the weakling insists on his his own power while the strong one abandons himself. So he's talking now about he's about to move into this discussion of like 
of the kind of metabolic capacity as a indicator of, of strength uh, or maybe organismic integrity. Uh, should we not precisely understand the strongest subject as the most successful metabolic agent, the person who makes the least secret of his hollowness, penetrability, and mediality, should not the most decentered individual accordingly be understood as potentially the most powerful? And did the central psychological model of modernity, the ego-strong self-realizer, not step on the scene as a polyvalent metabolism maximizer who surrenders himself to multifarious invasions, seductions, and appropriations under the mask of controlled consumer power. Now, that brings up two different, two very different, and to me, kind of conflicting um, images. Because on the one hand, we're just, we're talking about a a sort of reintegration of the maternal space and a a, um, reconnection with what he called the sticky, sweet, sweet doughiness of that sort of in, that primordial maternal uh, ingestion. Uh, so we have that on the one hand, which seems something that's necessary and positive. But then on the other hand, we have this vision of the kind of absolute consumer who's able to incorporate, take in like everything, literally the whole universe and become some kind of uh, God uh, in that sense, have no outside, have no, have no other. Uh, and <coughs> I'm, I'm not... Um, I'm not sure exactly where to, to draw those lines. And I mean, when we talk about these encounters that we have in this kind of quasi, the paranormal or the quasi paranormal with, um, or the paranormal, uh, or the paranormal. Yeah. With other, <laughs> other beings, uh, or even other people, like insofar as, you know, we we can be paranormal to each other, uh, just by the things that we say and the things that we mean, uh, we can be paranormal to ourselves. True. Sure. I'm in telepathic rapport with my childhood and with um, being an embryo in the womb and God knows what else. So I'm just wanting to jump in. And Absolutely. Well, so, I mean, my, my question is, or kind of the space that I'm, I think, wanting to open up. And I, I hope touching on uh, the points that you know, have been made thus far about kind of the incorporation and um, the exchange of bodily fluids, the exchange perhaps of psychic, quote unquote, fluids. Uh, that we're kind of entering onto weird territory there because, I mean, if there is a kind of healthy, unhealthy, and and an appropriate self-other boundary at the physical level, where are those boundaries at the larger, uh, at the psychic and subtle levels? Uh, And how do those boundaries relate to our uh, our entrainment as consumers uh, and as kind of maximizers, you know, uh, and, uh, or as a kind of successful metabolic agents, as, as Sloterdijk put, puts it. I, I, and I don't know, I'm, I'm struggling a little bit with that, with that whole kind of cluster of questions. And by the way, I want to say welcome as well to Donna, who joined the call uh, a little bit later and just welcome you to, to chime in whenever you feel you like that you'd like to. Okay. I think it's, we talk about uh, metabolism and, you know, metabolism is not just taking things in and, and, and out you know, as, as like a, as like a, you know, in like a tunnel, you're not like you're changing what you're ingesting as like, as you're ingesting it and, and giving it off, off of something else. So I think um, the, uh, I'm actually reminded of, there's a Tibetan Buddhist uh, practice called should, where, which is where you take your body and feed it to demons, but you transmute your body as uh, into uh, food for them uh, to nourish their, uh, their to nourish their spirits, uh, as uh, uh, and, and you know, give them to to give them the good karma to have a better rebirth. Um, and so, and so, and so there's this practice of like sort of ritualistically giving your body as like in, in transmuted form. Uh, to to these demons to, to generate good karma. So, I'm wondering uh, if I may interject. I'm wondering to what extent that uh, these medieval examples that he gives and, and Renaissance examples that he gives of the heart are atavistic survivals from the myth. What Gebser would call the mythical consciousness structure um, that we're sort of bound to be gotten rid of as we moved into the mental consciousness structure, and especially its late phase, the perspectival phase, which is the late uh, Northern European version of it. Because uh, 
I remember Gebs are saying that um, the primary, the, as these consciousness structures have evolved, they've become associated with different organs. The magical consciousness structure is linked with the intestines, with the viscera. And so you get disciplines like horoscopy, uh, studying entrails and looking for signs in them, uh, in spell casting and in magic and so forth. But that once you move up into the mythical consciousness structure with the high civilizations coming in and you get a divergence there uh, in the magical consciousness structure, everything is interwoven with everything else. It's, it's a net. Uh, everything is, is the self uh, is not separate as a figure against a, a cosmic ground. The self is woven into everything else. But with the mythical consciousness structure, things begin to become separated. You get the myth of the separation of the world parents. The sky separates from the earth. And the individual soul, in India, this would be the Atman, separates from the macro soul, Brahman. And so, or the yin and yang, Chinese symbolism. Uh, you get this sense of separation of the individual sense of self from the rest of the cosmos, even though there are all these effluxes that are still occurring, uh, there are still confluences and magical lines and so forth, because these structures, they carry on from earlier previous structures. And in the mythical consciousness structure, the heart, Gebser says, becomes uh, the central organ. So there's a movement up the body from the intestines to the heart. And then, of course, you can see this, the fact that the Egyptians, uh, when they mummified, they left the heart in. The heart is the only organ, basically, uh, that they left in, took all, all the other organs, left the heart in because the individual would need the heart in the afterlife when he or she was weighed at their personal judgment uh, against the scales. And so you would have the scales, and on one scale you would have the feather of truth, Mat, the goddess Mat, which would be a feather, and on the other scale you would have the heart. So they would put the heart on, and this would occur in front of Osiris, who would uh, give the final verdict. And if the heart was heavier than the feather, then this meant that the individual uh, has lived too selfish or too materialistic of a life, has not spent time learning the right spells, let's say, in the world, or has not spent enough time with the gods, or has not been open enough. And so if the heart is heavier than, uh, than, the, than the truth principle, mat, living in right accordance with the social order, then it's gobbled up by a being known as the swallower, a creature that simply gobbles, and you're in trouble there. You don't receive a place uh, in the afterlife. You're just gobbled up. And so I wonder to what degree, uh, because Gebser then says when the mental consciousness structure comes in, uh, the movement then moves up to the brain. And uh, already with the Greeks, even though Aristotle didn't regard the brain as, as something that wasn't important, it, it took a while for this to sink in. But with the mental consciousness structure, the brain becomes the primary organ, and it certainly does in Northern Europe. And I wonder if by the time we get to this, uh, the medieval period that Sloterdijk is talking about, we're already dealing with atavisms uh, that have been left over from the age of the mythical consciousness structure that were bound to be gotten rid of anyway with the shift in the evolution of consciousness uh, to the brain, which now, you know, everything uh, resides in the brain. We, the, the soul is in the brain. Everything we think about now is in the brain. And the heart is just this sort of vestigial organ that's still around in marriage ceremonies with, as I say, with the ring on the third finger, and in love, amorous relationships. And we say, my heart belongs to you. Your heart belongs to me. These are kind of atavistic structures that continue on from the mythical consciousness structure. So I just want to throw that out there just, just to maybe chew on a little bit and see what happens. Right. Yeah. I'm, what I find interesting is sort of comparing, um, uh, the, uh, comparing uh, Gebser and, uh, and his structures to uh, Julian Jaynes, you know, the famous psychologist. Who, yes. who, yeah. And uh, you know, and his idea that yeah, the, the sort of the, uh, the creation of the bicameral mind, uh, you know, uh, like that we once like lived in a world of spirits that were all that were all around us, and 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 it was just an everyday communication with them, and, and uh, who were these very anthropomorphized, uh, you know, not not particularly like not particularly different from us, spir like spirits that sort of whispered in our ear, and and, and so there was this uh, constant metabolism of that, and with the mythic structure, that's 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 when he sort of places the creation of the bicameral mind. Uh, and, and in a sense, the sort of the world gets hollowed out from from these presences, and then as uh, then you have these sort of rituals to reconnect to that, 
And I think it's interesting, this sort of, that's, that I think is where I see this creation of um, the sort of body mysticism we're talking about, because we see the, connect, the spirit as connected to like this organ of the body, like the, you know, and, and you, and you have these mystical practices of turning inward to, to, to achieve these higher stages of consciousness. And then with, with the mind, you know, we now tend to see uh, these sort of things in terms of, oh, they're like Jungian archetypes. They represent something in our consciousness, you know, that, uh, you know, that there, there's sort of the subconscious mind talking to the conscious <laughs> mind or whatever. So, 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 so these are all projections of the mind. We're the ones doing it, uh, we're, which is the whole reversal of like the magic structure where, where everything is happening to us. Um, well, that's fairly fascinating. Um, what I was, uh, John, you were talking about the, the neurocentric, uh, worldview that most of us are sort of has, um, gotten rid of the, um, the magical and the mythical. Um, but I doubt that. I mean, I doubt that we've gotten rid of it. Um, because you just, well, I wouldn't say we've gotten rid of it. I yeah, wouldn't say but, they're, they're, no, no, no. All, all of these structures are still here. I mean, especially absolutely. in the culture. Where the absolutely. Magic, That's the, exactly what I was going to say. But yeah, I mean, here. country, western yeah. music, opera, I mean, our, our poetry. Absolutely. We're, we're yeah. surrounded by all this broken heart stuff. And um, But I do think what you were talking about, this uh, neurocentric tendency. Country and western music, yeah, I like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. It does survive. And... Um, I think the, the I think what you're talking about the the mental deficient stage, which I think is dominant now, is thinks it has gotten rid of this. Which obviously, if you watch a movie or watch TV or walk down the street, you're going to be um, this mythical magical uh, motifs are still very much a part of our culture. So I was uh, struck too by um, this conversation earlier. I think. Uh, we were talking about um, mother's milk and semen and blood and secretions. And I was um, reminded of a of conversation I had in a bar with this mathematician, very smart guy. And he had a passion for insects and he was studying insects. And he was giving this little lecture on, on insects and how they communicate by uh, regurgitating uh, secretions from within their stomach into the, uh, the stomach of the other insect that they're communicating with and they're they're able to uh you know register information from these secretions and uh i said oh you mean trophallaxis and he said oh well that's a very technical expression i didn't know you would know that where did you learn that and i said well i was studying family therapy and um the instructor he talked about trophallaxis in insects and our version of trophallaxis is language um these animals secrete and share secretions in order to coordinate activities, social activities. And we use language. Language is the glue that holds us together. I, I sort of doubt that, but I think there's something, I think that's a very modern um, modern idea or even a postmodern idea. Um, anyway, I'm just throwing that out there because uh, I think there's um, I think there's also a lot more that holds us together than just language. Um, and language, I think, arises out of this uh, intersubjective matrix that I think Schlotterdijk is trying to, um, to look at and looking at the, the edges of the, of the, of the pre-self and the, perhaps the, the conventional self and the post-self or the transhuman, who knows? But I think there's a, I think we're in the, in the, in the middle of this. And I'm just throwing that out there that I, I was just um, resonating with um, the idea uh, that gets or gets this idea that the, the integral is the higher octave of the magical, the mythical and the mental. And I believe that uh, we're not anywhere near the integral yet or the apperspective. Um, but I think we're getting glimpses of it. And um, because I think we're in the, I think we're dominated by this, um, the deficient mental that need to quantify everything. Uh, anyway, just offering that as uh, just throwing that out there. Just want to add that to the mix. Thank you very much. <clears throat> well, well, may I ask uh, then, I mean, do, do you think, and I'll, by you, I'll just let this be open, uh, that there's something 
to that idea of m- being able to metabolize uh, the phenomena at, at all those levels uh, or all those in all those structures, the magic, the mythic, all of the entities, all of the spirits. But then also, as we get into the mental, uh, the language games, uh, the Absolutely. concepts, the ideas that... Perspectivalism. Right. Well, do we need to become kind of omniperspectival in some sense or, or, or kind of all-inclusive in some sense to achieve a, I don't know, a, a strong subjectivity or a strong sense of being? Where, where, where does that really... Um, where, does that, where does that really go, I guess, is what I'm saying. Are you asking the group this question? Um, I guess, I, yes, not yes, I am. I'm op- open, the well, open you. Like, well, well my, fe- my feeling is if we hold an intention and we relax very deeply and open ourselves up to the field, we can get some interesting results. But if there's no center from which an intention can be um, realized, I mean, sometimes this is, comes out of language. I mean, I can hold an intention. That's a perspective that I'm taking into other kinds of domains, like a dream space, for instance. And I can hold on to that intention, and I can use that as a way of inquiring. Um, and I think this is a different kind of unconscious, that, uh, because you realize the unconscious is not that unconscious. The field is very intelligent, but you need to have an intention. You have to have a sense of your own center, and you have to have an intention before you can safely hold any information. That thing, so, so they can be cross fertilizing by entering into the, the wherever that boundary is. <clears throat> so as you come back into a waking state, for instance, from a dream state, you can look at the different kinds of dream states. They're you know they're these liminal zones are hybrids of you know, all kinds of things going on. We don't have very good labels for them, I think. But you have to discern um, what's useful and what's not. Or you can really get crash and burn very badly. So I think um, in our, um, as we move from deficient mental into hopefully the aperspectival, whatever that could be, I think if there are enough of us who are able to find your center, hold an intention, and then relax into the field, you're going to get a lot of useful information. But if you don't have a center and you enter into that field, you're going to get fucked up really badly. So that's why I think the mental is extremely important. Uh, and I think Gebser points this out, is that we don't want to go back into uh, you know previous stages, uh, the mental and the mag- magical, and get sucked into the vortex of the dark side of those. Uh, and I think we're in the middle of that right now. If you look at the CIA, I've just been reading a lot about the CIA and the psychic espionage uh, program they had um, back in the 80s and 90s, and they may still. Um, you know, they were uh, they were trying to kill foreign leaders psychically. They were doing with Saddam Hussein and Noriega and others. I think this is fascinating that the CIA has funded this kind of research and has gotten some interesting results. So I'm just, uh, I think that's a very, perhaps a very nefarious organization and is using these psychic capacities that we all have in a very nefarious way. But I think we need to appreciate that as we become more open and available to all those potential field effects, we're gonna have to, uh, we may unleash capacities to heal and we can also unleash enormous capacity to destroy, and I think that's why there was a healthy tendency in the middle, in the in the in the mental phase, to mm-hmm. sort of okay, we're going to have to suppress these tendencies because they are they can be potentially used in in very dangerous ways. Um, but now I think we're able. I think we. I think we. I think we're going to have to deal with this because we can no longer sweep these anomalies under the rug. Um, if you look at our world today, it's just surrounded by, uh, we're just being inundated by um, these other alternate realities that are being sh- uh, shifting all around us. So we have to find a way, I think, to stay centered, inquire, open up, have an intention, and then relax into that field and get good quality information that's useful for whatever project you have. This will cause a lot of ethics, by the way. I mean, cosmo ethics. We have to think really very ethically about each other. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think you may have lots of psychic talent, but without that uh, 
ethics, I think you're going to be in uh, create a lot of havoc. Mm-hmm. I'm just talking from my own personal experience as well. <laughs> uh, I'd like to jump in with with a kind of thought and potentially uh, potentially um, a volley a volley move relative to this broader conversation. Um, I, I noticed, and I'll just mention for those that were here last week, that uh, our, our resident curmudgeon from last time is not present today. So I'm going to try to come off the bench and the curmudgeonly role here, which is... He just became uh, a grandfather again, by the way. So oh, congratulations, cool. uh, Ed. Cool. Uh, congratulations. Yeah, bring, bring it on. Yeah, well, well, so, and I just, I don't necessarily know if this is curmudgeonly per se, but... Um, I, I don't identify as someone who is really deeply invested in a positivist or a rationalist worldview, but as someone who doesn't have the, uh, I don't have quite the same in, uh, strength of knowledge or, or kind of desire to move into what, what I'll broadly call the sort of historical, literary, metaphorical discourse that I think a lot of our, our group conversations around this book tend to move toward. Um, I'm really interested in understanding, you know, the dynamics at play and kind of how things work. And when I'm reading Sloterdijk, uh, I find myself trying to divine, because it's not necessarily clear, clear, as Ed Mahood would say, what he's really saying is the dynamic that's at play here. What, what is physically happening? But I do think, and I certainly think that, John Ebert, your, your explanations of things really, to me, are very satisfying in, in explaining and understanding what the kind of core dynamics are. Um, but I, what I want to bring up is that I, I sense a sort of uh, and I, I mentioned post-humanism last time, but I, to me, the, post, the post-human the post worldview and the post-human thinkers, uh, one of whom, Bruno Latour, is one of the guys who referenced, who who's, who's gives the, you know, on the back of the book, says this, is, this book is awesome. Um, I, I really want to bring that into tension with this sort of, what, I, what, I, what I'm sensing, and I could be wrong about this, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm sensing that our conversations here still sort of tend into a sort of humanist framework for, for thinking about these things. We're still, we're still saying, and Soderdijk himself, you know, with his examples, you know, is obviously playing into this sort of humanism where we're focused on the person and the body and the, and the exchange of sort of bodily or even psychological with the pre built in assumption of sort of a singular uh, self sort of. And, and, and I, while I agree with a lot of what you just said, Johnny, about the importance of having a center and not, you know, opening yourself up to a lot of things, I think that the, the post-human worldview and the post-human philosophical paradigm uh, is really important here. And I think Sloterdijk, I would argue, at least from what I've read so far, is is complementary to, if not kind of directly aligned with these post-humanists that are looking to decenter the human for productive reasons, I would argue. Um, and anyway, I just, but I want to say some sort of one specific thing with regard to that. And unfortunately, I'm a bit removed from academia. So my ability to, uh, to reflect back accurately, the, the paradigm of posthumanism is going to be, you know, not necessarily there. Um, but I think one of the things, and, and Bruno Latour and, and Donna Haraway and other people in this that are broadly considered posthumanist, um, are, are very much interested and focused on, uh, well, what, what Latour and others would call the actor networks. The Instead of focusing on human humans as the agent, they're focusing on how any number of different sort of concrescences, and it is a bit Whiteheadian, and they, they draw directly, I think, on Whitehead for some of their philosophical groundwork, um, that these concrescences form an actor network that is effectively the agent of, ch- of change or of a phenomena, rather than, rather than kind of focusing on the human being as the agent of, of a phenomena, um, or any sort of singular predefined entity that we sort of take for granted in the world. They're very much, I think, about breaking that down and understanding, understanding that we are a variety of selves or that we, you know, and I think, it, again, I say it's complementary to Sloterdijk. Um, and, and one thing that comes out of that, uh, which was mentioned earlier too, is uh, the importance of coordination, I think. And I, I, f- I feel that Sloterdijk are maybe, but certainly to, the, to a degree this conversation, I think uh, we're not really talking about coordination as an ongoing achievement, which I think some of the other dialogic philosophers who also Sloterdijk, I think is complementary to focused on this, the experience of being fully of, of being hollow in the, in the encounter with something else. Um, but I think coordination and this, and the idea of patterns and repetitions of connection making, even, even the mother's breast and the, and the child's mouth or whatever, um, 
that there's that repetition and patterning and coordination are really important aspects of what it means to create an intersubjective reality, uh, generally speaking. And I know I'm kind of throwing out a lot of words here and, and going in different directions with this, but but my sense is that the the to me, the, the humanism that I that I that I that I want I, that I want to that I want to reading these acts of intersubjectivity as as uh, final and complete and sort of agential or, or driven by full fledged kind of preformed entities, as opposed to understanding them in a more post human model in my mind, which would be as an as a repeated kind of uh, achievement, right? And so so it's not so much the so the interesting thing to me, I guess, is not so much the, the one time I ingested the other self to transform myself. It's the ongoing ingestion of other selves and the ongoing process of transformation. And I don't know, that's, maybe that's just a subtlety and maybe it's unnecessary. And I just, but I wanted to bring that out because I think that the post-humanists, uh, for lack of a better term, and, and to be clear, I'm, I'm not talking about the transhumanists, which is a completely different, maybe, maybe in small ways related, but very different idea than post-humanism. But I think the posthumanists have a, a really important thing to to offer to understanding Sloterdijk, and certainly I think Sloterdijk is is towing that line. Or you know, and again, I don't I don't know enough to really fully know his body of work. But it seems to me that the posthumanists and and his work are complementary in in importantly decentering the sort of human, even if it doesn't necessarily come out in these chapters. So that's my kind of curmudgeonly two cents relative to the what I feel is a sort of humanistic bias in the way these conversations tend to go. And also, I guess, like a historical, literary, metaphorical way of approaching truth and knowledge, which I just can't hang with. And it's okay, but I just, that's not my style, right? And so, and I, again, to restate the disclaimer, I'm not a super positive, I'm not invested in being a positivist or a rationalist here. I'm just, I guess, trying to shift at least, you know, the, the potential to talk about things in a, in a bit more of a, you know, focused on the dynamics that are taking place at a, at a sort of scientific explanation or at least scientific discourse rather than a purely metaphysical or, or meta, you know, or sort of, um, I don't know, magical. And I, I, I'm, again, without, without being a positivist, I'd like to be able to talk about these things in a sort of concrete way that doesn't uh, always go to the, the magical, if only for the sense of kind of being able to relate this to, to things in, in the modern world or using a, a modern, you know, mental focused kind of way to, to just sense make, because that is my tendency for sense making. Um, so anyway, that's, that's all I have. And thank you guys for yeah. listening. Well, do you think that that has something to do with the metaphor of a sphere itself and with the, um, the way that Sloterdijk is using that to focus on, on what he calls interiors, which, um, tend to invoke uh, the sort of phantasmagorical, you know, literary, metaphysical type of realm uh, that, uh, that in a more modern uh, perspectival, uh, you know, way of looking at the world is uh, reduced to being unreal, uh, whereas the material is real, the, the, and, and uh, if not material, the network uh, or the like objective, inter-objective relationships um I, i've thought that like there's something specific and powerful about the, the spheres metaphor but that it would really need to be complemented by others uh like a, a network idea uh or active network uh theory or like a field idea uh even uh, because we could understand the heart emanating not only in a um kind of spiritual sense but we could also look at it in a electro ele- you know, electrical sense that it emanates a uh, field. Uh, and uh, I know that there's research be- that's been done into the way that hearts can sort of sync up in their, f- their frequency, you know, that they can resonate with each other electri- um, electrically or, or um, in some like subtle field effect. Uh, and that that would be an important kind of constitutive aspect of a sphere is having f- fields that are resonant within that that sphere and also having networks uh, of uh, actors who are coordinating uh, with each other to maintain the integrity of that particular shape, that particular container. Uh, yeah. I mean, is that, yeah. It, 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 do we just need to supplement uh, and, and like kind of not over-focus on, on the, you know, the particular metaphors that Sol- Soderdijk is using? 
Uh, if I may, um, I think one of the things that um, one of the reasons why he's using spheres, I think, is because a sphere is such a primordial form that it's almost everywhere you look in nature. Everything goes in circles. The time, the seasons, everything comes back in a circle. We're on a sphere. The planet is in the shape of a sphere, surrounded by other spheres that are orbiting around each other in ellipses, admittedly, after Kepler taught us that the ellipses, not perfect spheres. Copernicus wanted to, uh, the whole thing about Copernicus was to try to fix all the crazy Ferris wheel cycles and epicycles of the planets to, uh, by centering everything around the sun, he thought he could restore the perfect platonic spheres surrounding the earth. And the Ptolemaic cosmology, as, especially as it's pictured in the art, is always of the earth at the center, surrounded by spheres. And each each sphere contains a planet on it as a kind of bubble uh, that turns with that sphere. And so, and if you look back through the history of cosmology, uh, it's almost always being encased in a sphere. The, the, the world is thought to be spherically shaped. And sphere is also associated with the mother's body. The mother's body is sort of sphere-like. It's, it's curvy. Uh, if you go back to the Paleolithic great goddess figurines, they're sort of spherically shaped. They're very curvy. Uh, architecture, if you go back and you look at the history of the first houses uh, after the period of the caves with the Natufians, and the Natufians come in around 12,000 BC, and they're the first to start building houses, and they're circles. They're, they're ashlar blocks that are arranged like stone igloos that are in circles. And when you look at each of these sites, Murai Bed is another site, um, as they evolve, in the, inevitably, and it's true in almost every case, the early phases of the architecture of the site are spherical. They, they're, they're building the houses in circles and spheres, and only later on in the site do they start becoming rectilinear and angular. Uh, and it's as though uh, there's a movement from the feminine to the masculine, and the masculine is associated with the intellect. Uh, and the male body is angular anyway. It's not particularly cur- curvy by contrast, relatively speaking, with the female body. Um, and I think the sphere metaphor should be understood as a metaphor. He could have used other metaphors. I mean, I think Marco raises a really good point here. It could have been a field. It could have been a network. It could have been all kinds of different things. But there is something primordial about a sphere and thinking in terms of spheres. Plato says that the, that the form of the soul is spherical. It's in the shape of a sphere. And if you think about even if you look at the way that Gebser lays out his charts, they're, they're all circles. The, the magical starts with a point. And the mythical moves to a circle, and the mental moves to a sphere, and it just moves that way. Everything is in terms of these circles. So, um, to me, the sphere idea makes perfect sense that individuals t- together form a kind of yin yang sphere that is interlocked and in a biune way because civilizations are embedded in these intrauterine spherical shapes. You get these cavern cosmologies, especially with what Spangler calls the Magian cosmology that comes out of the Levantine world, the the Palestinian world, the Arabic world, where everything is rendered in terms of these uh, spherical shaped domes, like Hagia Sophia uh, is in the shape of a gigantic dome, and the basic mosque shape is in the shape of a dome. Uh, Spheres everywhere. And so, guess on Bachelard, also in the Poetics of Space, talks about spheres quite a bit. So for me, the spheres idea though I take it metaphorically and not literally, nonetheless makes a lot of sense to me that, that we're embedded in these spheres and that they've ruptured and collapsed. And now we're in a situation of spherelessness or at least in a fomic situation where each individual is sort of creating his own sphere. Um, there is something prim- primordial about this idea, about the sphere, something we can't let go of, something that's embedded uh, almost in a platonic sense in the architecture of nature and the way it's formed. It's full of spheres and circles not so much of right angles. Right angles, I think, come in with, with cities, with the intellect. Um, you know, if you look at Euclid's elements, uh, it starts right off with angles and triangles, and it takes him a while to work his way to start getting to circles and spheres, um, as though it's a, you know, and, and the sphere is irrational, pi, as we know, is a rational formula. There's something that the male mind can't grasp about the sphere because it resists rationality. It, it always comes back on itself. And astrology is based on this, too. Uh, it's just everything. Everything is circles and spheres. So to me, it, it makes a lot of sense. And I, I like the idea. So in defense of slaughter. Throw that out. 
Yeah, I think of um, yeah, like connecting uh, Solderdike to Latour, like is at her nowhere. So like, um, I, I think of it um, in terms of you know we're talking about metabolism, and I think that's for what what Solderdike is adding to this sort of Latourian ideas of of, of, of active networks because um, it's it's sort of like um, like it's not just that we're connected to each other; it's that we're mutually ingesting one another. Uh, part, but to you know, be, being hollow in ourselves, we t- we take others into our spheres and and, and digest them and and uh, and put them out. Um, I kind of want to on the whole CIA uh, psychic attacks thing because it makes me think of like Pharaoh, like uh, having his sorcerers try to cast spells on uh, on his enemies. And then uh, and I think of like um, Moses and the Exodus and, and uh, like the Moses in a sense can be seen as, as sort of in, uh, an emergence of, of the, of the mental uh, space with you know, the idea of, of monotheism and the idea of, of a single uh, metaphysics of, of, a, of, a, of a, a single um, metaphysical ultimate as, as opposed to sort of the mythic world of, of the Egyptians and the multiple gods. So, uh, so, 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 so in, a, in a sense, the excess, excess story is sort of a triumph of the mental over the mythic. I think I mean, part of what Solderdijk is also saying, though, right, is that we need to become more comfortable with spheres. We, we need to become more comfortable. Like, if there's an ethical imperative or something that he's pointing us toward, in this text, like, why are we reading this? Like, what are we tr- learning? Um, is some re embrace or re entry into like into an okayness with being uh, being enclosed in something, uh, and with um, with that murkiness, that kind of sticky or sweetness, uh, uh, or that ma- maternalness uh, of of the spherical experience. Uh, and I mean, I think that's that, that passage that I read earlier was kind of pointing in that direction. Like what is strength? Is it, is it to be able to be a kind of self-contained individual that, you know, can kind of survey the world, uh, through, um, a kind of, you know, meta perspectives on, uh, on, on, on its networks, uh, or on, on the fields that, that constitute it or, is there some receptivity or some submission uh, that's required to a um, to a more a softer space, if you will, uh, and a space where uh, you know the we are more hollow or more porous, uh, more permeable, uh, more kind of primordially or or a priori intersubjective, uh, rather than coming at it from like the egoic, the you know the, the individualistic or egoic uh, point of view. And that to me is where it gets a little murky and uncomfortable because uh, when you open yourself up to others, right, in a space like this or like any, you know, let's just say a social network, to, to, when you enter into a network, you do open yourself up to these, to others. Uh, and they may be people, they may be human, you may also think of them in other terms, uh, and particularly with media and media effects. Like we amplify our, our humanness into into almost you know to strange uh, phenomena. Like Trump is a mutant. What what is Donald Trump? I mean, can you regard him? And I don't mean him as the 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 person as a human. Uh, what is he? Uh, and I'll give another example. Like th- this semi relates to what I was talking about very early in the call. Uh, as I feel that I've opened up. I talk to more people, for example, I put out writing or put out uh, podcasts or what have you. There is a certain kind of uh, vulnerability that, that comes with that. And suddenly weird things come into your field. Suddenly weird you, conversations uh, take strange turns. People you haven't heard from or that you've never heard of uh, contact you and, and have strange requests. Um, I seem to have gotten a, some kind of a satanic <coughs> troll uh, on Facebook. Uh, just what like came out of nowhere. Suddenly, he's commenting on all my posts and posting videos of, uh, you know, necro uh, necro um, uh, metal music, something like that. But there's something. It's I don't know how to metabolize that. Do I 
you know, is that something that I just roll with and take in and integrate? Or is it something I need to start like deleting? And um, well, your, your immune system needs to reject it. It's, <laughs> it's immunologically inconsistent with your, your sphere. <laughs> well, that, I mean, that's what I'm wondering about because he, one thing that, like he says, can we regard the strongest subject as the one who can metabolize the most? And but, but metabolism could be rejecting as well. I mean, the shit has to come out, right? Yeah. Um, but if do we? I'm just changing the metaphor a little bit. Uh, hollow can be like hollow is a bell that resonates, right? So it's not just assimilation or digestion or metabolism, but it's resonance. We can resonate with a lot of different things if we're hollow enough. So that's just another metaphor. Hmm. But I, uh, find, uh, I, I think that hollow, empty, feminine, um, sometimes lonely is uh, very compelling. Um, because also we can resonate with different kinds of energies, uh, different kinds of entities. And I think uh, we can enter into intersubjective spaces Recognizing that we are a part of and apart from in healthy ways. Um, I don't know that the magical and mythical stages were very adept at this. I think uh, as we moderns and postmoderns, I think, are getting better at it. Some of us are. Anyway, I'm just throwing that out there to add to something that you're offering because you're talking about assimilation and metabolism. And I also just like that thing of just vibrating. We're also hollow tubes and we vibrate and we can amplify our vibrations. There are lots of techniques to do this. And I think Schlotterdijk is very aware of these techniques. Um, and he, I think he endorses the idea of using these techniques for various uh, projects. Yeah, like the CIA. <laughs> kind of jumping off from that and, and from what Marco said, I mean, I think, again, I'll, I'll say that I think the post-humanist thought is relevant in the sense that um, it may have different metaphors, but fundamentally, I think it's it's about that question, or, or one of the claims, broadly speaking, of posthumanists include that um, being receptive or being uh, sort of a vessel or, or hollowness uh, is is a stronger state in, in an actor network kind of paradigm uh, because that enables you to be a, uh, I guess, a hub. It, and again, I'm, I'm kind of probably butchering the, the perspective, but, but I think it's important, you know, in the sense that uh, the, the hollowness and softness and hollowness or, or receptivity, although it's, I think, a fundamentally feminine principle, uh, does not automatically equate with a sort of softness and a, and a womb-like protection. It's also, it's protection or it's safety, but it's also the complete loss of safety. It's also sphearlessness, sort of, uh, or at least... Being being receptive means not you know having a bit not having the immunological barrier right um, and so I, anyway I, I don't I know that Slaughterdyke's perspective is sort of immunological and he probably would have a lot more sophisticated things to say there but I bring that up partly because I'm struck by um, the I'm struck by this, this I do think that the modern condition or whatever you want to call that's not the right word because I know modern modernity is a specific kind of uh, reference term here but the the life in our current day and age whatever you want to call that is um you know is fundamentally troubled by these questions of of sort of openness versus closeness um and anyway and I just I think that's really interesting and, and also I don't know if this is is necessary to say but I I want to make sure that the the notion of an actor network in defense of the folks that are that are doing this stuff is not equated with a social network and in fact i would argue that the facebooks of the world are 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 you know deeply humanist and not post humanist in their in their makeup in fact they highly privilege this notion of a singular being entity that's why you have one facebook profile and not like a, a facebook profile that is an aggregation of each of your different actions which are not fundamentally treated as coming from a single profile in other words you know computer systems and modern social networks and this is kind of part of my own project but i argue that they're they're fundamentally really really deeply embedding these these values or these these assumptions about singular the singular nature of a of a being and sort of the fact that we are the agent of our action and so at at a broader level that's just to say that i think um 
examples from social networks like the one you gave, Marco, it, they, they point to the vulnerability and the problems of vulnerability, but they certainly, uh, if anything, the, the, the social network is, is a distortion, I would argue, of any real idea of like a true actor network or sort of spear formation process. I think we, we kind of have to go to the metaphorical realm to attribute Facebook interactions to sphere formation because in a, in a real sense, I think sphere formation happens at a much lower level and we need to not take for granted that the human kind of pre-exists the sphere formation. And again, that's uh, my, kind of my two cents, but I'll, I'll leave it at that. Can I, can I ask you something? I'm sorry. And I also, uh, Jeffrey looked like he'd wanted to say something earlier. Do you uh, still- well, I, it was, uh, I was, I wanted to speak to some of the things that Nate was talking about, which was, um, so one of the problems I have with Sloterdijk, um, it's an odd thing to say, I know, is that his text is very structured. You have to move through, and it's almost like he's starting inside in the middle of a sphere, and he's working his way out, right? He starts off with the heart, and then he moves to the faces, and then he moves to the selves, and there's this movement out through the text. It has a very structured feel to it. and. Um, I, it's like this, I think um, uh, John, not Ebert, but the other one, said something about um, uh, uh, teleport, tele, telepathy between the different parts of the self, the older self, younger self, and so forth. And that's very Sloterdijkian with this idea that we are multiple selves, that there isn't one self, but many selves, which is, I think, also part of what uh, Nate was getting at with this sort of uh, post-human kind of perspective. And that's in Sloterdijk, but it's not in this part of Sloterdijk. It's in later parts of Sloterdijk. And so because we're progressing through the text, it, it's like this part is very humanistic, but as we go further, it becomes less humanistic. And so in a way, you kind of want to read Sloterdijk as a rereading rather than reading. You want to read it all and then go back and start over and read it again in order to understand it fully. Because if you just look at this part, we're missing half the point in a sense because it's later on in the book. So there's there's a kind of a an odd logic to it. And it's, it's, kind, of, it's kind of silly because I complain about the fact with Deleuze that you never know what you're reading and you and it doesn't you get lost because you can't see which way things are going. But one of the advantages of, of Deleuze is it doesn't matter which order you read it and you can mix it all up and you can still make sense out of it. Whereas logic, it does matter what order you read, read it in. Um, Before you go on, Jonathan, I just want to point out that uh, we're, we're at just about 90 minutes and I want to res- you know, respect everybody's time. So let's just uh, make any final reflections. Uh, anyone who hasn't had a chance to, to speak, or not a chance, but hasn't wanted to yet, uh, this would be a great time to, to say hi or to offer anything, if you want to. Uh, Don, uh, Donna, uh, who came in earlier, you can also, intru- maybe we'll take a few moments for, just to say hi, uh, regardless. Um, but I think we should start to, to wrap this up. Um, and if anybody wants to stay on and keep going, if we feel like we're getting to something, I'm, I'm available to do that. Uh, but uh, I, wa- I want to kind of bring it to a, a close for, um, for anyone who needs to move on. And, uh, but you can go ahead, Jonathan. And, and, and also, we have a Jonathan, a John, and a Johnny. So we, we need to differentiate. Hopefully, we don't get another. Cause, uh, <laughs> but, okay, well, I, I was kind of... Uh, we, it brought up, like... Um, yeah, the idea that Sartre is trying to bring us back to spheres, you know, even this sort of, uh, you know, angular mental space. And I'm thinking, well, you know, from you know, Gebser's perspective, obviously wants to, you know, expand and not regress to a previous point. So, how, so I guess it's a question of how do we uh, reconcile this sort of the, the sort of mental rational with the sort of intersubjective um, or feminine uh, uh, space we're talking about. Um I, I one thing you know, we're talking about the spheres. I, I think of the cell as kind of, as kind of thing because it's not simply because um, not being simply hollow, but of being selectively hollow, of of having a membrane 
about us that you know, that sort of that uh, decides what goes in, what goes out, and uh, and uh, how, how things uh, get digested. Well, I, I guess I'm making a summary statement. I want to go a little bit into post-human and transhuman and get a little clear about what that is. I'm very sympathetic to a lot of post, what I've read about post-humanism and the non-human. Um, and I believe um, magical people were very attuned to the non-human and to the plants and animals. And I think we still are. I mean, if you've had a close relationship with an animal, you know how they're telepathic. And I've had lots of telepathic experiences with non-human, both in the physical and what I would call extra-physical or transphysical. So I need to get a little clearer in my own thinking, um, the, the maps that I'm playing around with at refining, um, I think the human, post-human, transhuman, what happens next after post-human? That's a question I would have. Um, and how, um, you know, these are all overlapping in some ways uh, and ongoing. And also the, the idea of per, uh, um, multiple personality syndrome, um, I don't think is a problem. I think it can be a problem if you have that very grid-like way of looking at things. Um, but I think we can resonate with all kinds of personalities, human, non-human, and uh, through reading and through writing and through, you know, relating. Um, and I think that's a... Uh, that's going to be, we need to stop pathologizing that. Yeah, I, so I, that makes me think of Deleuze, and I know Deleuze and uh, Guattari wrote Capitalism and Schizophrenia, which made the fundamental claim, among other, among other ideas, that schizophrenia is a natural state of, of being, almost, or I don't know if that's the right way, but they're essentially challenging the neurotypical standpoint on schizophrenia. Um, and I'm, I'm in no way an expert on that, but I just want to say that I'd love to, I'd love to talk more about, about this stuff. And I, I'm certainly not an expert on posthumanism, but I'm, I'm very interested to connect it up with, uh, with a lot of the stuff that you just said, Johnny, but more broadly with, with Sloterdijk and a lot of the other, uh, other influences and other conversation points. Um, and, uh, and just to say that I do, I do agree that magical thinking or, or I, I do agree that, um, in many ways, the post-human is a great complement to magical thinking, broadly speaking, and, and to um, resonance and relationships with the non-human more generally. And that's certainly a, a, its own channel of post-humanist thought. In particular, I'd, I'd throw out there that Donna Haraway has done some work on companion species as a follow-up to her initial stuff that she got famous for, which was more you know, the critique of science and the sort of cyborg stuff, which is great too, but she moved from that in pursuing post-humanism toward companion species as a, as a sort of site of research. And I just, I find that to be a very interesting transition and um, yeah, anyway, so. Me too. Yeah. That's a very cool, very cool topic as a subtopic of this Slaughter Deck discussion. All right. Why don't we wrap up? I do want to just point out Wendy's sign. She said, if you can't read, it says, if I talk, I cough. So that's, oh, but what, what, why, feel don't you, better. <laughs> but why don't you say hi anyway, even if you cough, just hi. <laughs> so you can at least hear your voice. Yeah. Hi everyone. <laughs> okay. um, I sound absolutely awful. And I keep, you know, trying to coat my throat and stuff like that. So this was really, really good conversation. And it, I wrote down a lot of notes and uh, I'll be thinking about that in preparation for our conversation next week or two weeks from now. Yes. Okay, thank you. And, and, and Donna, um, I wanted to w welcome you as well. Um, thank you. Thank yes. you. Yes. And, um, all, you know, we've all introduced ourselves uh, previously. Yes. Is there anything you would just want to say by way of you know, where, you are, where you are, your name? Yes. My name is Donna Abbati. I uh, live in Jordan in the Middle East. I've uh, studied literature. I'm studying philosophy at the moment in a critical institute here in Jordan. And I'm very interested in philosophy, and this is what brought me to the group. I'm also um, uh, about to publish my first collection of short stories. And yes, this is it. I work um, in a film institute. I'm very interested in films as well. So yes. <laughs> I'm glad you were able to join us. 
Thank you. My pleasure. John, uh, any uh, last words? Which John? Me? me? <laughs> uh, no, no. I, I, this was a great discussion. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And uh, I think we covered everything that we needed to cover. Next week is my favorite channel on uh, facialization, when he moves to the face and facialization and defacialization and all that. So I'm really looking forward to that. So. All right. And that'll be in two weeks. Yeah, uh, or, yeah in two, two, two weeks. Two weeks. So um, if you're watching this, uh, this video, uh, please join us. Uh, you can go to metapsychosis.com slash readers dash underground and learn more, see our reading schedule uh, and sign up if you wish to. And uh, once you do, we'll, I'll send you the instructions for joining, joining these calls. Uh, and um, uh, I think that's it. Uh, I, I still feel a little bit unsettled in myself. I, I have these kind of roiling questions, um, but uh, I'm sure those will, well, I don't know, but I, I hope we can those work. We can share them online, right? We can. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I'm always, I, that seems to be a, kind of, a perpetual state, though. <laughs> I, I, I kind of come in and out of that, that state of uh, an unsettledness, and maybe I just need to become okay with that. Uh, so um, that's it. Uh, thank you. All right. Well, thank, thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thanks, thank everybody. You. That was great. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.